Hi there, welcome back to my channel where today I want to talk about becoming a sports photographer and the things that you may not have been told or may not think about when you're at that point of taking up sports photography. So whether you're new into photography, broadly speaking, or whether you're already a keen photographer and want to branch off into sports and you want to know some of the particulars that maybe you wouldn't initially think about, let's run through some of those right now. Okay, let's start by talking about cost, sadly. Now, if you're already into your photography, be it as a hobbyist or semi-pro or whatever, you'll know that photography isn't the cheapest thing to get into or start off in anyway. Sadly, sports takes that up another level altogether and you will be finding things a little bit more expensive in all likelihood than whatever you're shooting. Now, maybe with the exception of something like wildlife where some of your glass and, and bodies might do a job for sports already. But when you get into sports, especially those that you will shoot outdoors, it can rapidly increase in cost. Everything from those waterproof covers for your cameras and lenses and your laptop cases and those little tents that you have to put your laptop in in order to file images from pitch side or track side, right through to the telephoto lenses and bigger bodies that can shoot at higher speeds and lower light. Everything costs more when you're talking about action sports photography. Another cost you might not have thought of, certainly if you're coming at this from a hobbyist angle, is insurance. I'm not just talking about the insurance for your kit, although that is something you should definitely take, but also public liability insurance. If you're attending a sport and event, like a football match, you've, most specifically if you're at a professional level or semi-professional level, you're going to need to take out public liability insurance. In fact, at some levels, when you get to EFL and Premier League level, when talking football, having public liability insurance for a certain value is actually a prerequisite of getting your accreditation. Check out the video on my channel all about the different levels of football accreditation and what you need if you want more information on that. Personally, I'd always recommend getting public liability insurance, whether you're a sports photographer or not, because if you do leave, a camera case on a path if you're in a park shooting wildlife or someone trips over a bit of your gear at roadside or whatever, they can potentially sue you if that is deemed to be your fault and your equipment has caused it. And so covering yourself with public liability insurance is definitely, from my perspective, something you should consider doing as well as obviously insuring your own kit. One other cost as well if you're shooting sports, certainly youth sports or anything in a youth environment, is you're probably going to need some sort of criminal background check. Here in the UK, that is called a DBS, a Disclosure and Barring Service, I think it's called, and you can also get enhanced checks as well. So it's definitely worth having a look at all these costs because by the time you've added equipment insurance, public liability insurance, and a DBS check, you've probably already added two or three hundred pounds onto the costs you didn't already know about. Next up, let's talk about access. And by access, I mean being able to gain permission to shoot the event that you want to shoot. And whatever it is you're shooting, be it a local sailing regatta, crown green bowls, soccer, American football, baseball, basketball, whatever it is, you're gonna need permission to be there and using a camera. Now that might be, if it's your kid's team, that might be as simple as asking the team manager and fellow parents and also notifying the opposition team that photos will be taken. Maybe you'll have to share those photos with the opposition team by way of thank you or on a condition of acceptance, who knows, right up to professional levels where that access is gonna to equate to accreditation in the first instance. And again, as I said briefly a moment ago, there's all sorts of different levels of accreditation depending on the sport and requirements you need to fulfill in order to get that accreditation. Another word of note as well, even when you have that accreditation in place, so let's talk my specialty, which is football photography here in the UK, even when you get your EFL or your Premier League accreditation and you have your insurance in place and you've got everything you need to shoot, access is still not a given because you have to apply on a match by match basis for which games you want to cover. So let's say you wanna go and shoot Liverpool versus Man United and you've got your Premier League accreditation, which if it's in your own name, is no mean feat to start with, or if you've even got it through an agency. The likelihood is matches are oversubscribed. I know plenty of agency shooters who get knocked back every month, several times a month to cover Premier League games and sometimes EFL games as well. 
because there are more photographers than there are shooting places available. And so access is everything and something that can really help this is building relationships from the off so that when these challenges face themselves, you've given your best chance possible of getting access to what it is you wanna shoot. There's nothing us Brits love to talk about more than the weather, or certainly that's the case if you believe everything you read. But I have put weather on this list because like it or not, if you are shooting any sport that takes place outdoors, the weather is gonna be both your best friend and your worst enemy. Whatever your wow moment was or your light bulb moment was that kind of made you wanna shoot sports, beware that you are probably gonna to have to shoot it in all weathers. Again, talking from my experience in football, I have shot in rain, wind, gale force wind, storms, sleet, hail, snow, just about everything you can think of. And sometimes it isn't that pleasant, but I always make sure that I continue just to try and get the best shots possible. You will spend many, many, many hours in at events in bad weather. It could even be roasting hot weather with no cover that you're sat in for two or three hours and it is actually draining as well. So beware that the weather is probably the unglamorous side or one of the many unglamorous sides of sports photography people don't realize. It isn't all glitz and glamour and shooting top events on lovely kind of cup final weather we call it here in the UK when at the end of the season you're seeing cup finals get played in lovely sunshine. That's so seldom the case and instead you're going to spend most of the season, most of the events in rain, wind and freezing temperatures. I've covered a little bit of motorsport years ago as well, the World Rally Championships when it was held in Wales. Again, you are going to be camping in your car potentially, you are going to be trekking in, in mud up to your knees, you're going to be covered in all sorts of muck and sludge as well. So if you're getting into sports photography, just be aware the weather will make life difficult and will become a massive consideration. Certainly for me, every Saturday morning, the first thing I do is check the weather if I've got a game that day because it does impact what I do so, so much. The other consideration, after all this, the event you're covering, you might have sat there for three hours in the worst weather and you know what? You'll hardly get any good shots from it and you'll wonder why you bother. But stick with it because it is incredible and it is really rewarding every now and then. All right, next thing I wanna talk about is the fact there are no second chances in sports photography. If you're covering motorsport, a historic pass up the inside on the last corner to win the race is not gonna happen again. They're not gonna come around a second time and perform the same maneuver for you. A goal is never gonna be scored twice in football and so on, you get the picture. So there's a few tips here is everything that's within your control, make sure you do. So don't let your camera go to sleep. If there's no action for a few minutes, just make sure you click on the shutter a little bit and um, just to kind of focus if you will just to keep it the camera on and ready to shoot because you know what before you know it in sport it can change like that and you've got action to shoot and if you've not had your camera ready to shoot and it's gone into like a, a sleep or a standby mode those couple of seconds or even a second while it wakes up it could be gone there won't be a second chance to get that shot also don't find yourself getting drawn into just watching the sports whether it's because it's really good or really bad Always keep looking, kind of a good rule to follow actually is always keep looking through the viewfinder. If you're gonna watch the game, just watch it through the viewfinder constantly because at least then you're ready to fire those shots if something is about to happen. That makes for a good shot or you want or need to capture. Now, every single sports photographer you ever speak to will miss shots, right? I've missed several this season, but the good thing is I know that I could not have done anything to kind of help me get those shots because they will happen when you're blocked by other athletes or players or, or scenery or something will block your view. If it's celebrations and, and football or whatever, they might run the opposite side of the pitch and have the backs to you and be obscured by the goals and by other players and all sorts of different things. These are things we can't really impact. What we can impact is that your camera's not on standby, is that you're watching the action and that you are ready to shoot. So. Don't be angry that you missed a shot. Of course, there'll be no second chance for that either, but just make sure that it's not your fault that you've missed that shot. And last but not least, and I'm really loath to mention this because it is quite rare now. It doesn't happen very often. I hear of it more than I've ever experienced it myself. 
And that is the little bit of snobbery that can exist, like it does in any other trade in the world, by the way. Speak to a plumber you've got coming to do some plumbing in your house and they'll talk about a job they've had to rectify for someone else because that plumber wasn't good enough or not experienced enough. Well, it's kind of the same in sports photography. You'll get some people who believe they have more right to access events or be in certain positions than you are. Woe betide you if you're an amateur or a hobbyist or a semi-pro that manages to get to certain sport and events. There was probably be a photographer at some point who will probably indirectly refer to as a weekend warrior or a part-time or not have the right to be there. Ignore it all, grow thick skin, take it in your stride and do what's right for you. And if you do all that, you'll have a great time. So enjoy your sports photography journey. I really hope this video has been useful to you and allowed you to consider a few things that you might not have previously done. So please subscribe to my channel for plenty more sports photography content. And otherwise, I'll see you on the next one.